Thank you very much. We are a few minutes past 5.30. Welcome to the Project Working Group Hill Block Committee. I appreciate your presence. I'm Dr. Stephen Holt. I'm your facilitator for our work tonight. This is a special meeting, very uh, significant meeting, and we have uh, some special guests with us uh, around the work that we're going to um, partake of tonight. So hopefully you had a chance to pick up all of the paperwork outside. Uh, where you will see the agenda for the night, you will see the um, charter, which we will be signing tonight, and you will also see the memorandum of understanding, which will be uh, signed tonight. We are not going to read through all the documents. You have them so that you can, I know that's heartbreaking, I'm sorry, I apologize. Would you like to? No. No, okay, I didn't think so. So, um, you have the documents, you have the opportunity to read through them. And again, we're going to follow very closely uh, to the outline as, or to the agenda as outlined. There are two sections that are kind of key sections, I think, for what we do tonight. Our mayor, who is here, uh, will have a chance to talk about the Hill Block and um, share perspective and vision and value around it. And then Catherine, the um, new CEO of Legacy will have an opportunity to do the same. And then we're going to give a moment or two to the project working group to ask questions, to interact with the mayor and the new CEO. Now that's going to be reserved to the um, project working group specific at that moment. You'll see later where it says public comment, and we're most likely going to have more than five minutes for that tonight, um, where there'll be opportunity for individuals who sign up to then come and share, and you'll have a time limit to come and do that. So again, thanks for being here. We've got a lot to do, and we're excited about doing it. Trust that we're ready to go. We're going to do a quick roll call, and we will begin from the gentleman at the far right corner facing the room. So, Mr. Green. Stephen Green, uh, board member, Black Investment Corporation for Economic Progress, BICEP. Walter Robinson II, um, board member of PALF and representing Urban League as well. This elite, it should be green. No, no. Sit. I tried that. Okay, here we go. Stereo now. Charles Wilhoyt, Legacy Health Board of Directors. No. At the top? Yeah, shouldn't have to push it. Push it. Just if it's green, green, you're good. Tony. Wow. <laughs> Tony Hobson, uh, President CEO of Self Enhancement Inc., and also a member of PALF. Anthony Deloney, uh, Director of Self Enhancement Inc. We'll push that toward him. E.D. Montanay, NAACP. Good evening, Shannon Callahan of the Portland Housing Bureau. Kimberly Branham, uh, Prosper Portland. I'm Bryson Davis, Seoul District Business Association. I'll uh, keep the Elliott and I'm representing the community at large. I'm one of the co-chairs. Catherine Correa, Legacy Health. Ted Wheeler, Mayor. Thank you, Shabri Vickers. Um, it says PCC, but uh, Community Development Officer for Wells Fargo. Shamika Owens, Portland community, born and raised, also here representing EDPA2. Mike Alexander, um, representing the uh, Black United Fund and POIC, and I chair the Black United Fund. I'm Donetta Monk from the Urban League of Portland. Sharon Maxwell, community member at large. I turned it off. Justice Raji, Portland OIC. Leslie Goodlow, Portland Housing Bureau. <clears throat> Cupid Alexander with the Mayor's Office. Thanks, everybody. Uh, again, welcome to our meeting. Now, the majority of us are aware of how we do what we do in terms of creating an atmosphere to make sure that um, all voices are heard because all voices are important. So when you have something, Project Working Group, uh, that you want to say or weigh in on, I ask you to take your uh, name card and turn it to the side and then wait. I will acknowledge you 
make sure that we're not over speaking one another, et cetera, et cetera. And then where we disagree on topics, we understand we're not attacking people. We don't uh, have the opportunity to honestly address topics and so forth. So we've gone through our kind of uh, agreements with how we do our, and run our meetings on a regular basis. This is really for the sake of those who are listening. That being stated, let's go to our second item on our agenda and hear from our mayor, Mayor Wheeler. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I want to start off, is Chef Melinda Sandifer here? Okay, so uh, we have Mississippi Chef has provided meatloaf in the back of the room. And I got to say, it's fantastic. So thank you for organizing that. Um, not all meetings, usually I, I get peanuts or something like that. And I'm really, really happy with this because my wife is a vegetarian. So I would not get meatloaf <laughs> if I were home right now. And I love it. So thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you all for having me here today. Uh, I'm on the agenda for 25 minutes. I won't do that to you. And I want to cut to the chase because I, I know that there's a lot to be covered and I don't want to waste precious time. Um, let's be honest. This is a difficult process. It's tedious, it's time consuming, it's emotionally draining, and sometimes it has been very difficult to navigate. And I'm sure going forward, there will be times when it is very difficult to navigate, especially when it comes to bureaucracy. And believe me, I know that. I hear it, I understand it. Yet, of all the projects going on in the city, this is one that I have chosen to focus a considerable amount of my time and my attention because I believe it is one of the most important that we're working on. As I've said many times, this isn't just a development project. It's not just about the 1.7 acres. But the process this represents is trying to collectively create a vision for a community that overlapping entities at the city of Portland systematically dismantled over a period of decades. I know that there's nothing that can replace that lost sense of community, the loss of a thriving community center, but I know we have to start changing the process on how we intentionally engage members of the community and embrace true inclusiveness as part of this process. And our goal is creating an opportunity for those who have been the most impacted. It's a tall order. It's a tall order. But the people around this table and the people in the community who are working hard to help shape this conversation are up to it. I'm convinced of that. Which is why I'm pleased to be here again and participate in tonight's milestone for the Hill Block and the work of the project working group in signing the Memorandum of Understanding and moving forward collectively towards the future of this space. As your mayor, I've relied on the expertise and very importantly, the experience of many of you around this table. And I appreciate that we've had the opportunity to meet, to have conversations, to have discussions not just about this particular project, but a wide range of issues in the community. And I appreciate that many of you have been called to serve many times by me personally. And many of you have stepped up to the plate many times personally. And I cannot thank you enough for that. I wanna thank you for your leadership I'm grateful for the city's partnership through Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau, and I'm pleased that the directors of those bureaus are here. They're actively engaged, they're enthusiastic, and they're supportive of this process. I'm pleased with the engagement of Legacy Health. All of these entities have worked really hard to make sure that this is truly a community-centered process. I also want to thank the community at large. I want to thank in particular those active community members who have shown up, who are not sitting at this table, but who have been and will continue to be a vital part of this process. I want to thank you. And I've heard from many of you 
whether you've watched the video of these meetings online, whether you've read the project working group updates, or received verbal updates from friends or families, or project working group members, thank you for your input. And I look forward to your continued involvement in this process. It's reassuring to know that the project working group has a working charter, and with today's MOU signing, a clear outline of respective responsibilities has been outlined that will allow us to continue to move forward in a productive manager, manner. And I'm inspired and I'm energized by this process that you have led. And I'm excited about the conversations to come, conversations that will include things that are not easy conversations to talk about. For example, we're gonna talk about funding. We're gonna talk about land use. We're gonna talk about building designs. We're going to have challenging conversations about ownership, about tenanting, about the potential of residency options. And yes, we're gonna have crucial conversations about the URA. All of these things are important conversations to have, but none of them will be easy. You already know that. I know the project working group will make intentional and deliberate, deliberate recommendations in this regard to these issues and more, and I most certainly look forward to it. And through it all, I want to reiterate my strong and unwavering support for the project working group and the community-centered process that you've been leading. I want to thank your co-chairs in particular, Lakeitha Elliott, thank you, Lakeitha, for your work, and Bryson Davis. The pay hasn't been very good. <laughs> thank you for your volunteering in a leadership capacity. And Dr. Stephen Holt, uh, as always, thank you for your outstanding facilitation and leadership in providing clarity and framing the discussions of the project working group. And to all of you who are on the project working group, I thank you. It's evening, you have families, you have friends, you have other commitments, and you've chosen to be here because you share the vision and the opportunity that this Hillblock project represents. So now uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Catherine Correa. She's the new CEO of Legacy Health. Uh, I want to uh, tell you how excited I am that we have her here in this community and providing leadership and that we have an opportunity to benefit from that leadership in very short order. She has uh, become a player in this community. She has shown that she is uh, highly motivated to make our community a thriving and equitable and prosperous community for all. Uh, while she has significant responsibilities in her company as the head of the organization, as the leader of that organization, she's already demonstrated to me and to many other leaders in this community that she sees her role as being much broader than that and to address not just the health of the community through their members but to talk more holistically about the health of the community and her background and experiences I think put her in a very, very unique position uh, to help us lead this important project forward. So with that, uh, I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, we're turning it over to Catherine Korea. Is that correct? Madam Chair, co-chairs. How do you say that, Madam and Mr. Chair? I'll work on that. Chair. Yes, Chair. yes that's correct. Thank you. Three fingers, no, I might get really small fingers, but I want to prove that I was listening, so thank you for that. Um, as the mayor said, thank you for that very kind and generous um, introduction. Um, my name is Catherine Correa. I have been with Legacy Health now a total of about eight weeks, um, so came here uh, in June. Um, most recently in my uh, working life, I was with uh, organization, a health organization in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and as leading that organization, uh, was really um, very privileged to spend a lot of my um, time, energy, and actually my own personal passion around working with the community. And that's simply because we know that health is, happens not so much inside walls, but where we live, work, 
play, worship, go to school. Um, and so that is our interest. That, in fact, is what attracted me to legacy, is that commitment to a holistic definition of health. And that is why, of course, um, I'm, we are here tonight um, and um, will continue to be a, a partner uh, in this work going forward. Um, one of the things I um, did when I was here, one of the things with Dr. George Brown um, and others, was to make sure that I understood uh, the history uh, of this project. I was uh, briefed on it, but I will tell you right from the beginning, I don't have the same insight. I don't want to represent that I have the same insight, experience, or, or nuanced understanding of the history of the project. I know some facts, um, but of course um, have been um, through the last couple of months, uh, I have understood um, what this has meant to the community and by um, the presence of the working group here tonight know that it is important. So the best thing that I can do um, is to assure the um, project working group and the community that legacy, uh, even though we've had a change uh, in leadership, we are still um, as committed as we have been um, to working with the group and bringing this project um, to fruition. So thank you very much um, for inviting me tonight, um, and we look forward uh, to continuing to work with the group. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Catherine. We appreciate that. At this point, um, we've got some time for the project working group members to interact with the Mayor and Catherine and ask questions or um, if there are thoughts that you'd like to share or something that you want to communicate, here's your opportunity to do so. Mayor, uh, Tony Hobson again, self enhancement Inc. Maybe just a question, just I'm just sitting here thinking about all, of, as you talked about the many projects and things that are happening around the city. Have you given any thought to some of the other projects and how they might be interrelated or connected to this project where we may be able to leverage what we're doing for Hilltop uh, as it relates to some of the other potential projects and things that you've talked about around you know, housing, employment, et cetera? Thank you, Mr. Hobson. And the answer is yes, and I think about it a lot. Um, I'm fortunate to be mayor at a time in Portland's history when we are going to be doing a lot of development. We have the question of the Broadway corridor, which is the greater post office site. We have the potential of a significant project in the south waterfront with the properties that are controlled by the Zydell family. Across the new Tillicum Crossing, we have the OMSI site, and they have already uh, put together their master plan <coughs> development team, Gerding Edlin and others who will be composing a master plan for that area. There's a longer term vision of the Rose Quarter site and all of these things have the potential to link all quadrants of our city. And I believe we have to be intentional in terms of how we develop those projects, who benefits from those developments, what the community engagement around those developments looks like, and how we want our city to look, to feel, to grow, to prosper and thrive literally for generations ahead. I mean, there has never been as many opportunities in play in the history of this city that I am aware of in modern history as there is right now. And while the Hill Block is probably, well, it is just factually, it is a very small development site compared to these other opportunities, this one's first. And so how we do it and how we engage the community and how we procure the development of this project and how we define what we want the site to be will set a tone and tenor and a template for larger development projects throughout the city. So I, I think it is um, very important as a first step, but I wanna go beyond development for a moment because I started my remarks 
by saying, I understand that this is more than a development. It happens in the context of a racial history in this city and in the context of a community that has been with intentionality undercut by local government and other leaders in the community over a history of decades. And it's not just related to other projects that we're talking about around development, but I think about, for example, the conversations Pastor Mondane and I had around unreinforced masonry. It's not really a development project, but a lot of the same issues come to the forefront. There's a history, there is a desire for community understanding and engagement and respect of the community in that process. I think about the conversation I had Bishop Holt with you just a few days ago about the firehouse and the possibility of that being a thriving black arts and cultural center in the community. And again, a lot of the conversations we had centered around history, around opportunity, around engagement for the community. I think about the Hill Block in that same context, and I think about the conversations I've been having with my friend Rukaya Adams and others around the potential future of the, the Rose Quarter. And again, these same issues are coming to the forefront. So in a really interesting and I think important and significant way, we're starting to see all of these projects, they're all linked. They're all very different in their conception. They're very different in terms of the goals that people are trying to accomplish. But in many ways, we have an opportunity to create a new history going forward that's very different than the prior history of this city. And I see you as being uh, instrumental by helping us to do this first project right. Uh, I wanna say there's a little pressure on you too though, because if we screw it up, it's gonna set us off on the wrong foot for some of these much bigger development opportunities. So the work you're doing, while it's maybe smaller scale, consider it uh, a very, very important uh, base setting or template for the work ahead. That was way too long, Tony, for an answer, and I apologize. I don't know what. It was the meatloaf. The meatloaf gave me extra energy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, is it me? Uh, well, just a follow up. I mean, I, I, mean, I think it, it does put a lot of pressure on us, but I think it also puts a lot of pressure on you because I think the question isn't whether or not we're going to do this and do it right. We're going to do it right. The question is, based on this template, will the city and others be willing to use a similar process with these other projects that are like 40 times the size of, of this one that you don't necessarily have the same control over? Will we be interested in uh, being as intentional on those sites as we are on this one? The, the answer is yes on the parts we control, but it's important that you just mentioned, Mr. Hobson, that we don't control, you know, that this is very much a partnership between the city and legacy. And the, uh, the Broadway Corridor project is largely a public project. It is sponsored by the public, although there will be many private sector partners. Uh, OMSI controls their site, that is theirs. Their board controls that site, but to the degree possible, we want to be actively engaged in the development of that. They're eager to have the community engaged in that development and have a bigger, uh, have a bigger vision for the city. But of course, they're also trying to protect what is um, effectively their endowment for OMSI for the years ahead. And they very much think about it as an endowment opportunity and Zydell uh, is almost entirely a private sector project, but we'll have something to say about community benefits, community assets, infrastructure, and public works in that process as well, and housing. Um, so what we learn through this process, we might not control as much of those large developments as we do in this particular partnership, uh, but I think there, there's you know, certainly important parts of this that will be carried into all of those projects. I, I don't know if, if Kimberly, if you have a different perspective or Shannon, a different perspective, you know, you're, you're engaged in all of these. 
Okay, uh, so I just got whispered to let everybody know who I am. So I'm Kimberly Branham, I'm Executive Director of Prosper Portland, and um, I think I would echo everything that the mayor said. Um, I think I would add that the development community is watching us. And I think that there's an open question on the table about whether you can, in fact, start with community priorities and then build accordingly. Um, and I'm optimistic and I believe that we can. Um, but I think that that's still an open question in some cases. And so I think, as the mayor said, it really matters that we show that we can do this here um, because I think that is going to bear out in Broadway Corridor and OMSI and, and in other places where we can show that they're not mutually exclusive, that development, you know, market fundamentals and community priorities. Um, we're we're going to have to have some conversations about trade-offs, but I believe that um, when we start with a clarity, which is what I think this project working group has done about what's important, um, who's in charge of what, and how decisions will be made, that that can be really helpful. So I would just underscore that that um, I know there are a lot of people watching, and this matters to um, a number of different sectors. Michael Alexander, question. Thank you. I also wanted to just, um, and I actually want to piggyback on, on Tony's comment and question. I think um, you're right in that we have a portfolio of opportunities now and everybody will be looking to see how we leverage them. But I also think in looking at those opportunities, there's some uniqueness within several of them. And if we look at Hill Block, we look at Albina, it is focused on creating new communities. It, it is, it's not simply a development initiative, and I look at, as I look at OMSI and, and Zydell, uh, Broadway Corridor, we want to make sure that the downstream benefit of those CBAs and others accrues across the community, but this effort and our binder are targeted at not only recognizing the impact of old history, but writing new history in terms of creation of community around this work. And I hope that that's not lost because the drivers on that are very different than market drivers, which we want to leverage where we can and how we can. But there's a unique set of expectations here. And so I think when we ask ourselves, what problem are we trying to solve? There's a special answer around this work. And it may not be consistent across every other project. But I do think that if we lose sight of it, we lose sight of a unique opportunity that the players, because of their property ownership and the control they may bring to some of the decisions around this, have a unique opportunity to make happen. Thank you. Thank you. Shamika. Yeah. See, I see that. I don't it, know what happened. Mine doesn't stand as well, but it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. I appreciate the support. <laughs> um, I, I honestly want to um, piggyback now off uh, Mr. Alexander, and in, in, in that, my hope is that we recognize that this is not just a project. This is like way bigger than a project, and hopefully, oh my bad, there project. You there you go. Okay. Go. Um, yeah, that we recognize this is this is way bigger than a project and hopefully it's a journey and us right now in this moment taking a first step to first be really acknowledge where we are in this moment be honest about how we got here so we don't repeat and and also to take an honest look at even right now as where we stand what's working what's not working what has worked and what's not worked because for us to continue on pushing through even in areas that are not working, I think is, is, would be a catastrophe one because it's a misuse of our time. And as you said, we have lives outside of this. Um, yeah, the pay is not great, but our hope is that ultimately we all gain because we grow better together through the process. But if we don't stop along the way to kind of have checkpoints, I feel like it, we may end up not reaching our ultimate goal anyway. Thank you very much. Walter. <clears throat> Hello, Mayor and Hi, current um, CEO at Legacy. Welcome. Um, I have a question around um, something you just said around connecting the four quadrants of our city. 
um, which all happen to be in the metro corridor, our downtown corridor. I'm just curious to see as we continue to build through this process, what this process would look like as we continue the investments in East County and make sure we didn't make the same mistakes we've made in North Portland um, and the surrounding areas as we look towards future investments and development in that area, considering that it has a higher number of people of color, including African Americans out that way, and how we plan on using this as a template to how we could better um, work on the development in that area, given that we are investing millions of dollars um, in that area for the next 10 years. Yeah, I, I want to be um, crystal clear about this. A focus of my administration, and I, I don't think my colleagues on the city council would mind if I said a council-wide priority has been equity for East Portland. And if you look at a whole host of and I'm just talking narrowly now about investments. If you look at investments in things like parks, investments in transit, investment in roads, that kind of thing, there is no question that East Portland has not been well served historically by those kinds of investments. And one of the reasons I liked Kimberly amongst the applicants for the leadership of Prosper Portland was her clear understanding and acknowledgement of the equity requirements in East Portland around prosperity. Because a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about development, when we talk about procurement, when we talk about job training, when we talk about technical skills, when we talk about entrepreneurial and small business support, what we're really talking about writ large is economic opportunity. And there, are been, there have been portions of our community that have been systematically excluded from economic opportunity. And I would include home ownership, by the way, in this, and Stephen, yeah, I, you, you were diplomatic. I forgot the North Northeast housing strategy as being another one of these Im important intersects with the work that we are doing. Um, in all of these cases, we have not made the kinds of investments that lead to healthy, dynamic, vibrant, and prosperous communities. And then, when it came to Northeast Portland, we made those investments in a way that gentrified it and drove people out. So instead of making the kinds of, you know, parks, schools, roads, sidewalks, the kinds of things that make a community healthy and vibrant and supporting business infrastructure and entrepreneurship and small business ownership, we came in after the fact, and I, by we, I mean historically, we um, displaced the people who were there. And so your point is really important to me because I don't want to be on the vanguard of the next generation of displacement in East Portland. People who've already been displaced one, two, three, four, five or more times are now trying to hold down a beachhead in East Portland or even East Multnomah County, Rockwood, Gresham, and it's just as important to me that we address those issues. I mean, we're, we, I, I met with you know, the mayors from around the region just this morning, and Shane Bemis from Gresham was there, and we were talking about the lack of affordability already in communities all around the region. And as you know, uh, it's even more unaffordable for people of color. There is no neighborhood in this city on average, that a person of color, on average, based on average household income, can actually afford zero neighborhoods. And that's already being pushed into East Multnomah County. So rather than doing a redo, I would like us to make the kinds of investments in the community, and this is why I supported the Portland Housing Bond, it's why I support the Regional Housing Bond, it's why I support the aggressive work that our Housing Bureau is doing, this is why I support the work that Kimberly is doing around economic prosperity. A lot of people are wondering, well, what, you know, I thought that was a development agency, why are they worried about creating a thousand small business owners and entrepreneurs with a focus on women and people of color? It's because of this. We're trying to create the beachhead. So um, I want you to know that this is very much on the minds of the Portland City Council. And uh, rather than just talk, I'll just tell you this, my budget proves it. My budget proves it. And you can always, you know, I'm a numbers guy. I'm a numbers nerd. I'm a finance guy. I can bore anybody to tears. But my budgets will tell you where my priorities are. 
and you can hold me accountable. And I'll tell you, if you go and you look at my first budget, you'll see that I made that commitment to East Portland, and I will continue to do so. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Mayor and or Catherine? Thank you both for being here. Wait, wait. Oh, Walter yes. just snuck Walter. in. <laughs> Uh, only because I've asked this in a few meetings. Uh, so we have a very finite budget just to keep this group running. Um, and thank you, Mayor, for adding the additional $50,000 a few months ago uh, to keep this group running. But when that funding runs out, um, Mrs. Catherine, uh, would Legacy be willing to add additional funding to keep this group going so we can continue to do the work that we were tasked to do? So I believe the question was, would Legacy continue um, to fund? And I um, want to just make sure we understand that Legacy has committed um, $15,000 to keep um, to this organization. That is an amount um, that uh, the board has approved. Um, we do want this organization uh, and to keep working. We understand the, the time frame. Um, and at this time, that commitment um, stands. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, we appreciate your presence uh, again, Mayor and Catherine, for being here. Um, at this point, we're going to hear from our newly elected co-chairs, Bryson uh, Davis and Lakeitha Elliott. Thank you. So again, my name is Lakeitha Elliott, and I'm excited to uh, take on this new role as co-chair. Uh, one of the things I stepped up to uh, to be in this role because I felt that it was important to have someone who had roots in this uh, in this community uh, in this role and to uh, share it with Bryson is exciting. Um, I'm a fourth generation Oregonian. Um, I'm here because my great grandparents on both sides of my family uh, decided that they would make this their home. And um, again, we're five generations in now here um, and mostly in North and Northeast Portland. Um, I'm here specifically serving on this committee uh, in honor of my papa, Billy Patterson, and his mom, Verla Thompson, who um, were displaced by the Legacy Project, um, and my grandfather, Clarence Smith, who uh, in his final days talked about doing the jitterbug over on Williams and Russell. Um, and so it's personal to me. Um, this space and this area uh, means something to my family, and I hope that we can move forward a project that uh, will benefit uh, my family um, and lots of black families in the future. I have a 21-year-old and hopefully they can benefit from this type of work and project. Um, I'm excited to move forward with this process and the project and I appreciate the commitments that the mayor and the city and Prosper have made. But at the same time, I want us to be clear that this process isn't happening because they one day decided that this was a great idea um, or that they wanted to be accountable to the community. Uh, we are here because um, the community showed up and spoke up and pushed back and called for accountability about this space. Um, we're here because black law organizations like POF and the Urban League and SEI showed up and pushed back and said that this space means something to us. Um, we're here because young leaders like Serena Boston Ashby and Rachel Gilmer and Cameron Witten and Stephen Gilliam uh, worked really closely to uh, push the mayor and the city to do this, this project. In the open letter that they sent in 2013, they specifically called for this property be, to be returned to the black community. And I want us to be clear that that's why we're here. We're here because the elders like Maxine Fitzpatrick and Tony Hobson Sr. and uh, Senator Avel Gortley worked alongside those young people to push and move this, um, this work. And so I just want us to, again, honor and respect that that's why we're here, is because the folks in our community showed up, spoke up, and pushed back. Um, like I said that open letter was sent by Paul in 2013, so here we are five years later still, you know, pushing and working and showing up. Um, I think that for us to be uh, successful in this work, it's going to require that continued commitment from the community to show up and to speak up and to push back and to hold the city accountable, to hold legacy accountable, to hold Prosper accountable to the things that we're signing off on in this MOU and to other commitments that they've made to us. And so um, I want to put that call out to the community to continue to show up and speak up and push back. 
Um, for us on the committee, I really want us to, um, to think of ourselves as the critical friends, that yes, we're doing this work um, alongside uh, Prosper in the city, but um, let's not forget to continue to be critical and to continue to bring the voices of our community and hold them accountable for uh, the commitments that they're making. And so I'm gonna pass it on to Bryce and he'll talk a little bit more about the future of the project and thinking moving forward. Hi, so I'm Bryson Davis. Um, you know, urban renewal projects, they've often been touted around the country as uh, projects to help communities like ours develop and um, bring, bring us out of poverty or help this aspect, help that aspect. Uh, but a lot of them just have the effect of driving up housing prices, driving up the rent, uh, making it difficult for, for businesses to, to operate in, in those neighborhoods um, and displacing people to other areas where they end up with the same problems uh, that, they, that they started with and they're having to go through the whole process again. Um, you know, this community was promised when the Interstate Corridor URA was developed back in the early 2000s that it would be different. It wouldn't be like uh, the Emanuel Hospital uh, project, uh, at this time the urban renewal money would be used to benefit the poor, to benefit the elderly, to benefit the black community. Um, you know, we, look at, we look at this area two decades later, uh, we look at who's really benefited, uh, and you look at the, the large white developers that have leveraged the, the funds that were available under the URA uh, to build these huge expensive apartment projects. Um, that that we can't afford to live in. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an attorney and, and there are some apartment buildings in there I can't afford to live in. Um, rent's not affordable in North Northeast anymore. Uh, neither is owning a home. Uh, I was walking down Shaver uh, not too long ago and there was a house for sale for $800,000. Uh, know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how, how everyone sees it, but to me, $800,000 homes, they don't benefit the poor. They don't benefit the elderly and they're, they're definitely going to benefit the, the black community. Um, so why should you all trust, uh, trust that this time, this project will, will be any different? Um, and I think the answer to that question is, is the people, the people at, at this table. Um, urban renewal dollars, other funding mechanisms that have been used in the past uh, in, in order to push these projects forward and, and fund, fund what's, what's been done, uh, they're just tools, uh, you know, like a, like a car or a drill or a hammer. Uh, what makes these tools work for us, work for the community, uh, or what makes these tools work for rich developers is, is all about the people who are wielding the tools and the people making the decisions on how to use these tools. Uh, now, our working group uh, at this table is, is from all around the community. Um, uh, people, people working to benefit uh, various different aspects from, from housing to business to, to our children, uh, to our health, things like that. Um, the, they share your concerns, uh, they share your reservations, and uh, they share your distrust. Uh, and they also, just, they also share your desire to right the wrongs that the previous projects have created. Um, these, the people in this group, um, they, they're here to ensure that the voice of the community is incorporated into this project and that this project addresses the concerns that we've been trying to address for decades. Uh, the people here have been given the ability to make decisions on, on this project uh, over and above what we've seen in, in previous projects about who does what, what goes where, what gets built, who does the building. And the people at this table uh, are, uh, are going to make the decisions in ways that will benefit the residents and, and the businesses uh, of this community. And so one thing I've seen so far in, in my work with the, with the people here, with this group, is that they're genuine in their commitment. 
Um, they're genuine in, in their desire to, to, to see this project uh, benefit the people who are here, not, not people who will move here in 10 years, but the people who are here. The rent is too high, houses are too expensive, businesses can't afford to operate, people are being pushed out of neighborhoods that their families have lived in for decades. Um, and since I've been here, you know, the, the politics of Portland seems to be to give lip service to all these, all these various problems. You know, you, you hear, we'll fix this, we'll fix this. But then when it comes to the actions that they take, the voice of the community is, is left out. Um, the people at this table are part of the community. They're not part of the Portland politics. Um, we'll not approve a project that will just be a, another empty promise. And that, that isn't why we're here. Uh, so I trust this time it, it will be different. Um, not because I trust the mayor, not because I trust Prosper Portland, but because I trust the other people sitting around this table who are going to be making the big decisions as to what this project becomes. Um, now, as this project develops, uh, your voice will become more and more Im important. And we've been very grateful for the participation that we've already gotten, that, that you guys have, have already brought to, to these meetings and uh, have, have provided to, to, to us through PROSPER. Um, and we're going to need more of that engagement going forward. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to any of us, come to the meeting, send us your thoughts. Um, I'm sure the, the people from Prosper will be happy to tell you about the myriad of ways that you can, you can send uh, stuff through them. Uh, we're here to deliver a project that matters to our community. Uh, Lakeitha just talked about you know, how we got here and, and how people showing up and, and people making their voices heard got us to this point. And we need, we need people to keep showing up. That way we can turn this starting point into a finished product that we can all be proud of. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, we're just going to sign then the MOU. Uh, do we have the photographer? Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna sign the MOU and there's going to be a uh, picture taken of the group that has committed themselves, the project working group that's committed themselves to this process. Now part of that request uh, that has come around taking the picture has been to optimize the sunshine and the building. So while um, there is signing going on up here, we're gonna ask, Project working group members, are they following you, Yvonne? Okay, we're going to ask the members of project work, working group if you will follow Yvonne. We're going to take a picture outside with the entire group, and then we will be back to continue our meeting. So uh, members can go that way while we're signing here. Yep, yeah, she's going to come. Oh, Tony, I'm sorry. Wait a second. Tony had a question. Nah. Mr. Hobson. Don't have a question. I uh, just want to make a quick comment. I just wanted to publicly say thank you to our two co-chairs, you know, Bryson and Lakeitha, for taking on the role. Um, and, and, and Lakeitha, I just want to say to you, uh, very, very proud of you. Uh, we need someone like you. I mean, I don't think anybody can question uh, your passion, your advocacy for this community. And there's something special about having some direct connection to the history I mean, family members that, you know, when you look in the mirror, you see them and you understand what they went through. And it, sometimes it takes that level of connectivity to stay in a fight uh, as, as long as necessary. So just wanted to publicly say how much I appreciate you and Bryson for taking this leadership role on for the group. Thank yes, thank you. Can we give them a hand? Thank you guys for the work. Okay, so Project Working Group members, if you will follow the direction of Yvonne. Oh, I'm sorry, it fell down. Yeah, Shami. <laughs> oh, I just really quick, um, just with respect to the fact that we are a bit ahead of schedule, and also on the agenda, it does speak to again. Thank you both so much for stepping up to the co-chairs speaking to the MOU. I don't know that they spoke to the MOU during their um, their uh, the expositories on where we came from, how we got here, where we're going. But I feel like for the sake of the community at large, 
it feels like it would make more sense to maybe do a quick read through just so that we actually speak to the MOU before it's signed for the general public. but that it has been posted um, and went, along, went out along with the meeting announcements and those kind of things. So it is accessible online. Okay, uh, I didn't know that was a... Yeah, we, we did talk yeah, about Yeah, we that, did at the beginning. Yeah, that, at the beginning, um, went through that. It's rather so, long. And before I... And there are copies available at, uh, at the door. The, there are copies of all of the paperwork um, out front. There are no MOUs. Yeah. We have some extra. Well, I tell you what, if the project working group members would be willing to share their copies with those, because we have them in our emails, we've gone over this repeatedly. So we want to make sure you have them, and so you can take a moment and read through what the memorandum of understanding is, what the commitments are. They completely, absolutely spell out. Right. This one, this one, you're supposed to, I don't know which one we're supposed to. Boom. Find. Spells out the commitment of legacy, spells out the commitment of the P Prosper Portland, the City of Portland, Portland Housing Bureau, etc. So we're going to let the project working group step out now, and I'm going to ask for our signers. Shannon Callahan, the active, uh, acting director of the Portland Housing Bureau. Kimberly Branham, the executive director of Prosper Portland. Of course, you've heard from all of the others who will sign now. Where is our Do you want photographer? Yes. 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 We're going to. Where is it? Where to go? Ah, oh, here it is. Beautiful. Photographer. Photographer? Please? I know. I just. Yeah, we're just going to. Right here. How would you, you want them stage any particular way? No. You just, oh, just the sheet only. Uh, this yeah. one, we're only doing one copy? Uh, Apparently. And Um, so there is a point of clarification in our agenda, and I want to speak to two things quickly. The agenda identifies a budget discussion on adding the hill block into the URA. That is incorrect. That is an incorrect uh, item on the agenda. It should not be there. We are not having a discussion around adding the URA uh, into uh, or adding the hill block into the URA. That is not the work of this committee. It's not the work of this committee tonight. Um, we are going to talk about milestones in relationship to the work and kind of laying out our process. So that's the first point of order. So um, my apologies for however that got on the agenda and how that was communicated. That is not what is happening tonight. Yes, Bert. Thank you. It's an excellent question. So for those who may not have heard, Bird's question was, for those who read the agenda ahead of time, thinking that that is what was going to happen tonight, what do we now do? So our process is this. The process of the project working group, Bird, the process of the project working group is to have conversation around URAs and then we'll make a recommendation to the uh, Prosper Portland CDI. Prosper Portland CDI has the responsibility to make the recommendation to the Prosper Portland Board. The project working group will deal with whatever is then reconciled or decided upon by Prosper Portland related to that property. So the project working group's pro uh, responsibility is to work through the development, which is in the charter, to work through the development and to determine a developer and to have a robust community engagement process. 
And that community engagement process will consist of a variety of elements giving opportunity to hear from all community members and get feedback on thoughts and ideas around what should be developed at the Hill Block site. So this group will have a discussion around URA. They will then make a recommendation to the CDI. The CDI will make a recommendation to the um, Prosper Portland's board, and Prosper Portland's board will determine what they do or do not do. So there is another, there is a meeting of the um, Prosper Portland CDI that is coming up next Thursday night on the 20th. On September, September 20th, um, and Prosper Portland staff, would you put your hands up? So, Ms. Bird, those are the individuals to tap into for any specific questions around URA. So again, that is not what will be transpiring at this meeting tonight. But, oh yes, thank you. And, and at the pace of, as, uh, our co-chair, Lakeitha, just made mention of. I did make mention of this at the beginning of the meeting. We are going to have more time tonight than the five minutes for public comment. And so there will be more time for tonight for those who would like to weigh in and share thoughts. Now, going forward, this is what you need to know. I will say it again. Going forward, there will be meetings that are only community engagement meetings. The reason why the public comment has been limited up to this point is there was necessity for the project working group to do the work of defining what their work was going to be. We could not have public engagement without identifying the work and the scope of the work. So the responsibility was to do the scope of the work, lay it out, and then from the layout of the scope, then determine the next steps. You will find, and what we're going to talk about right now, are the milestones. So our conversation at this point is going to shift to what we believe would be productive milestones to keep moving forward so that this work is effective. I hope that answered questions. And if not, stick around and we'll make sure they get answered. All right. Does everybody have a copy of Milestones? Do we have a copy of the Milestones? If you look at your... This was also emailed to everyone. It was uh, from our last meeting. We talked about the question that uh, Alicia Moreland Capulia asked the group was, what kind of milestones would we need to keep things moving forward? And Joy, uh, Elise Davis, put together a list of proposed uh, approach. And from that proposed approach, then MJ Manefer sent it out to everyone in your email. And we weighed in asking for the project working group members to weigh in on it, to give some thought and some feedback to it. And so I will give you some moments to look it over, and then we will talk through um, this document with the effort of kind of defining the next steps for the project working group. Let me give you some moments to look it over. Part of the conversation we were going to have with budget with um, kind of came out in the conversation that Legacy has committed an additional amount of money to support us in moving the process. Originally, we were kind of told that we weren't going to be able to continue the process after October if this didn't go in the URA. Now we have some additional funds from Legacy to help continue move this process, and so we don't have to hurry up and decide about the URA. So that was part of the budget conversation that did come up earlier that Legacy has committed some more money so that we can continue this process. No, you don't have to push it. It should just stay on. Yep. Is it still green? Yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate that comment. And I, I will say, uh, as a trustee with Meyer Memorial Trust, Meyer is in the neighborhood as well. And this point was raised early in this process, and I would be very interested in having something presented. And as a member of the committee, I can speak to it to possibly get support from Meyer to help us continue through this process, assuming it's a 24-month process. So I would be very open to endorsing that and promoting that uh, at Meyer. Oh, that's excellent news. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can draft something around that. Okay. 
So the idea as we talk through milestones is to weigh in and think about what are the necessary steps so that we have a thorough process um, to make sure that the work that this committee is charged with is being accomplished and that the community is being engaged in appropriate manners. Again, Joy Elise put some thoughtful process to it and um, without just going, unless there's a specific way you'd like to approach it, we can go through each point uh, and you have opportunity to weigh in and say, hey, I think there's something we should add in this, in this uh, section. Okay, well, we'll begin. Much of the first points have been accomplished. The MOU, and the approval of the charter, we have the co-chairs in place, and there has been discussion around forming subcommittees. As you look at those subcommittees, would you consider those appropriate? Do you think there's a subcommittee that should be um, added that hasn't been addressed? So one thing I'd like to start with on the subcommittees is you'll see the next point is the determine if we should be included in the URA. And I think uh, the finance subcommittee should, um, as soon as we get them up and running, that should be their first project is to flesh out all those details um, so that we can be as informed as possible when we make that decision. Um, so I expect that subcommittee uh, to have um, some some work to be done immediately. Uh, and um, I also anybody with um, looking, trying to look at Stephen Green, but Walter's in the way. Anybody with uh, experience uh, in this area would be, would be really helpful to have on that committee. I wonder if on that one, um, is it we should make a recommendation to the CDI or should we talk to the CDI first? and find out whether this is a priority of theirs. Because I think that's a ton of work to do to make a recommendation to them and then have them say, this isn't a priority for us. We didn't, we're not planning on allocating funds. It's, it's a no-go for us. And so um, it seems to me that they've been kind of tasked with um, saying yay or nay when it comes to uh, expansion of interstate corridor urban renewal area. And so I think it's only fitting before we spend a bunch of time and money um, and, and brain damage on going that route to kind of hear maybe their just baseline initial thoughts and know the difference of if it is included, what, what's that dollar amount? Are we talking about a million dollars, $200,000? Like, because um, I think that'll shift how we do um, what's laid out in that, in that piece. Shamika. Um, Thank you. I would like to say yes and. I feel like by pulling this conversation to the back door of a finance subcommittee takes away from all of the work that has been done up until this point because if we look at the milestone two, um, those bullet points, some of those we have done as a group. So what we're saying now is we're gonna take a select few to go and finish the work that all of us have been engaged with up till this point and that doesn't seem authentic to me. I think any subcommittee, pr appreciate the point, I think the goal of any subcommittee would be able to, to concentrate, to drill down, and then come back to the larger committee with their findings. So not making any determinations among themselves, but to take the deeper dive and then come back uh, with their findings. So I think that was the conversation that we had. Yeah, yeah, that's the, the point. Any, any decision that would be made would be made by the group as a whole. It wouldn't be made by the subcommittee. I mean, I see the subcommittee as the people who will go out and gather the information to bring back to us or if we have questions, because all of us clearly are not going to do, like we're not all going to go and do that. There will be some education opportunities for us to learn, um, but for them to really delve deep, to share out the information with us, to give us what the concerns are, to be the liaison to the CDI, um, because we're all not gonna go to the CDI and talk to them. And so to have those folks who, that's their commitment, is to make sure that um, they get all the information, they bring it back, that they're sharing it with us um, is valuable. And I think we'll do that at the same with the community engagement process, is that there will be some of us who are focused on that. Not to say that everyone else won't be, because we'll all be there, but to be able to move the work, it's gonna take us you know, being in small groups and moving certain pieces of it forward. Charles, thank you. Charles. 
Uh, yes, yeah, since we do have co-chairs and since we are all very committed to the process, it would seem that uh, the co-chairs could come together and assign each of us to those committees that you think we're best suited to serve on. Uh, and obviously people would have the opportunity to opt out, but I would think that's probably the most efficient and effective way for us to get the subcommittees formed. Okay. Well, we were gonna be nice and ask you all which ones, but we can- I'm, I'm afraid assign. we might no. be here a long time. <laughs> well, taking that in, in light, are there any specific committees that do jump out for uh, you as a committee member? Maybe there's something already that you think, you know what, I'd love to be a part of this. So, Walter? I just have a question. Um, can you be on? Move it to you, move it to you, move it to you. There okay. you go. Um, can you be on more than one subcommittee? You Something that's not, you can? If you can commit to it and we'll do the work. Okay. Wonderful. So without calling each member's name, I'll just give you an opportunity again. Is there any specific subcommittee? Two things. One is that you, uh, in looking at, think, you know what, I'd love to be a part of that. And then secondly, is there something that you think should be there that is not there? Yes, Tony. So we, we've already had the discussion, I mean, I missed a, a meeting or two, about what all of these committees actually do. Yeah. We, we already had that conversation no. not at all so these are just proposed milestones from joy elise davis okay so is the question right now are we just saying whether or not these are the right subcommittees or are you asking That's us you're not asking us which committee we want to be on then i'm asking both okay and i'm, I'm saying, asking both and i'm saying to answer the second part i would i would want somebody to explain to me <laughs> what, they what they are what each committee is and what they do and what the expectations are etc I think so the uh, again as we just said the development and finance subcommittee first will be focused on the URA question and conversation then moving from there we'll be talking about funding and money and what we would we need whether it's an URA whether it's not um, how we're going to get that money that kind of thing but the first part of it will be focused on the URA conversation uh, and then the community engagement collaboration subcommittee will be focused on our public engagement process so how are we gonna engage the community to, you know, to get their input and feedback? So that'll be the first focus. Um, and then also the report back, the coming back to the community to say, here's what we heard, here's how we're gonna move. And then that community benefits agreement is we've always talked about this property, this project benefiting the African American community. And so how do we do that through community benefits? And so that group will be focused on where has that worked in the past? How can we, um, make sure that the benefits actually come back to the community? And so that'll be that. Part. And I think we imagine that the Community Benefits Agreement Subcommittee will be a little later down the line, but right now the focus is really on the public engagement process and then the um, Development Finance Committee and deciding around this URA conversation. Um, yeah. And are there, if other folks think there are committees that, you know, we should have or um, that would be great too. I think there was a small subcommittee who talked about, talked through what these subcommittees might need to be. Julian. Thank you. Um, it appears to me that a lot of these subcommittees are kind of sequential and not concurrent, which to me is actually a good thing, but I would just like to encourage everyone to you know, volunteer for at least one. Um, but the one that is jumping out as missing to me is an RFP drafting committee, much like there was a uh, uh, subcommittee to work on the charter um, that's an intense document to hash out in a large forum and so adding that at the end uh, you know once we have what we want the community community benefits agreement to look like the next step would be draft an RFP and that's just um, it'd be great to have a few versions of that to kind of go off of in in the meeting so that's what I would add hey, Julian, I'm curious, like, excellent and the mic. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Story of my day. Um, I just wanted to know what committees does 
the oversight committee have if they have any subcommittees and if they do uh, do you think any of those uh, would be useful for us to create um, we, we actually don't have any subcommittees because we are at, um, our function is oversight and not the drafting of documents so it's a little bit of a different function um, but in this case I think and it's a also a smaller committee I think Dr. Holt can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have about a dozen people. So it's a little easier to hear everyone's voice. And again, speaking for the North Northeast Housing, since we're oversight, we're not engaged in determining direction, we're reviewing and assessing. So, yeah. And Jillian, do you see that uh, RFP drafting committee as separate from the community benefits? Or do you think they might? Yeah, those are two. I think those are two different functions. One is, I think they take um, slightly different skill sets because you, we are really going to want someone who has responded to a RFP before on the RFP drafting committee, knowing how to make it clear. And that, to me, is different than. To me, the community benefits agreement is is a little bit more visioning, and the RFP is more like a contract that you're asking someone to participate in. So I think they, it very well could have a lot of the same people, but I, I see like it as, yeah. I see it as different, different. but okay. happy to be wrong. Uh, yeah, I kind of feel like the community benefits will be part of the RFP sure. request. And so that's why I was thinking that they might need to work closely with you. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. From a process and operational perspective, would it make sense to have the two co-chairs, and I'm assuming there's going to be a head of each subcommittee serve as an executive committee that could do that exact function as far as drafting or framing an RFP? Because I know Bryston, you, and I think Jillian, you were very involved with kind of the template for our MOU and the charter, uh, and I know we would want the two co-chairs very involved with that RFP process, and once again, assuming each of the subcommittees has a head, you had to have a group of five that would be intimately involved with all the aspects of what we've gone through by the time we get there. Uh, and I don't want to defer or place more responsibility on individuals, but it seems that would be one way we could approach having a, a group to draft an RFP. Yeah, yeah I, and actually one of the things that I'd like to add for the subcommittees is, um, you know, Keith and I were, uh, we're talking, we'll probably split the subcommittees between us, so at least one of us is present uh, on uh, each of the subcommittees that, that we form. Um, as far as, you know, subcommittee chairs or subcommittee heads, uh, we can kind of make those decisions as the subcommittees go um, uh, on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but know that we'll be, we'll be a part of, one of us will be a part of each subcommittee that we, that we form. So we've talked about whether or not the, sub the RFP subcommittee needs to be different from the community benefits, and I don't believe they need to be absolutely separate. I think they are subsequential in nature and just when they would come up based upon us determining what we want to do, building a community benefits agreement. But I think what we're talking about is doing things in similar fashion to how they've been done in the past, and I don't know that we need to model that same way. And so I think having individuals who are specific to the community benefits agreement um, and all of them sit and or serve on the RFP is extremely important. We don't want the voice or vision to not be there while we're writing the contract. Um, I think that's literally what we're trying to do here is something different. So I think mm -hmm. we need to just carefully plan that out and not delineate between vision or remove vision from the contract that's, that gets written later on. So right. I think we can, we can plan that folks who are serving on the um, community benefits will then also plan on moving forward and serving with the RFP. I mean, I think we're the same group of people, so it's going to be the same yeah, some I of us anyways. But I don't think we should delineate in our minds a contract being written by some technically savvy person that doesn't also include community members who are primarily connected to benefit um, of the community. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts regarding that? Yes, Walter. Um, I just wanted to note that this is a draft, right? So. We're working, we're adding to, taking away. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure we're not working off a final document. Um, I do see those big bold letters drafts, but I didn't hear that mentioned at all. Now, Walter, can you talk to the microphone? Because I'm sitting. Ah, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Just move the microphone. Um, 
Yeah, just move it. Put it between no, no, it's the cool. It's cool. I just wanted to make sure that we all know that this is a draft and not a final document, because um, kind of how we're working is we're working as if this is a final document, um, and there was no comment about it being a draft. So I just wanted to make that noted on the record. Well, maybe I didn't use the word draft, but I did refer to the fact that it went out in all of our emails and we were asked to weigh in on it. And so tonight what we were doing is exactly that, weighing in on and adding to and or removing. So I did not use the word draft. You're right. For the record, Dr. Holmes. I appreciate it. Anything else in section one? All right, section two. Uh, Manefer, if you would come to the table, please, sir. The center section, please, sir. For those who do not know, this is the project manager of the Hill Block Project for Prosper Portland. I ask you to come because much of this is around the URA, URA education, URA discussion, URA implementation, uh, uh, kind of um, expansion and or insight. We've talked extensively in regard to uh, some joint effort, some joint opportunity, the possibility of bringing some people back to do some education. We had a uh, joint meeting, and I think this would be a great time to kind of weigh in on some of that discussion. Oh, sorry. Uh, Walter, if you look on the paper, it says draft. <laughs> oh, we just, just, you just want to double check. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing this evening? Great. Good. Yes, we've had several conversations about the URA. Um, as we said before, Lakeitha said it best earlier, that it's been used as a weapon in, in the past. Uh, we are working to make sure that we have language that makes sure that there's protection within that information that it doesn't get used as another weapon against the community. Um, Dr. Holt and I, myself had an interesting uh, meeting this morning uh, with the organization uh, Mercy Corps of how they're doing a project at 120, is it 122nd? 122nd Avenue and how they're, it's a community project and where the community owns gets a chance to invest and has a, a ownership and gets a dividend. So that's one me method that we're looking at. We're also looking at other methods of how do we use the URA in a different method. I think we talked about it where you can use URA dollars, but you don't necessarily have to take development dollars. So I think that's a discussion that the Finance Committee can have, as well as are there any other alternatives that are out there, which I'm still researching to find uh, you know, alternatives out there. You know, it gets very difficult because you have um, private developers and then you have community developers. But at the end of the day, they both want to make money. So how do we make sure that they are making money, but the group and the community is not being blindsided and not being able to have ownership or you know, given a property over where there's no, no ownership in it and it's basically another development project. So we're working with our legal department to make sure we draft language within the deed that talks about that and how do we use it in a URA so it makes sure that it protects the community and not harms the community. So we're open for a discussion. There's all kind of discussion behind the scenes of, in the, I call it the dark room, where we're going back and forth trying to come up with ideas and you're more than welcome to email, email me if you have any ideas or any suggestions that you want to make. I'm open to all suggestions. But we want to make sure that this is community driven versus Prosper Portland driven. You know, we're here as technical support to support, but we want to make sure that the community is protected and that this property is protected and owned by the community in some way, shape or form. And so as we keep moving, we'll you know, keep you updated as we you know, come to that realization of what is the best way to use the property? What is the best way to finance the property? Is a URA the best way? Um, at this present time, I don't really know of any other way that we can finance it unless we have a bank, you know, or private investors that are willing to invest. And I'm not really seeing that come into fruition that it, it would remain an African-American project. So if anyone has other solutions, ideas, you wanna chat, I'm open. Hope that answers the question. I'm going to have you hold the question for just a moment, Jillian, because I just realized before we went to section two, I should have asked, is it agreed upon by the project working group that the co-chairs will select the committee members? It was, it was suggested that the, the co-chairs select the subcommittee members. 
I will suggest it, that they just identify who those subcommittee members would be. So was that agreed upon or was there some idea or feedback no, was, around that? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. We'll bring that back around. Thank you. Shamika. Yeah. First, my understanding was, as Walter pointed out, this is a draft. So we haven't even really landed on whether or not these are the subcommittees that we're selecting. All the more reason why we wouldn't agree to them uh, naming people to subcommittees we haven't landed on. Um, also, for the sake of maintaining transparency, as I stated, I would be inclined to stay on all three. And we've already pointed out that these are se sequential anyway, so we're, we wouldn't necessarily be doing all three of these works simultaneously. Correct. So I would tend to, kind of the point of the group, is to stay on all of the subcommittees and be able to maintain that voice at the table. So I'll ask a broader question and I'll try to word it in a way that maybe I haven't uh, to this point. The goal tonight is to make determination as to the direction of the project working group. Our effort was to send this out in advance with the request to read it over, process, and be prepared for the discussion tonight. It doesn't appear that we're prepared for that discussion. Is that correct? No. I I don't understand okay. where it means we're not prepared if we're saying we don't agree with it. No, that's not what I mean. Okay. That's not what I mean. So, so for again, point of clarity? Right. What I'm, I'm trying to, what I'm asking us to do is to make determinations about what should be there and what should not be there. Are we prepared for that discussion tonight? To say these groups make sense, these groups don't make sense, there's something missing, there's something we need to, need to add. That's what we were to come to do as part of our work for tonight. So I'm asking, are we prepared yeah. to do that? No. Mm -hmm. So what so will it take? James to said no, and Sharon says no, and so I, uh, Raji. This is Justice Raji. Justice. Um, okay, I have a couple points. One, as stated, these committees, I think, are a good place to start. Mm -hmm. I think the um, reality of beginning some activity um, while understanding that we can change either the, the, the definition, the spread of what a particular committee is, is not evaporated by one taking a step to having another meeting. Um, and as far as my own, I'm at, you know, obviously as a member of the working group, we will give input on all of the outcomes, any outcomes from any of these committees is going to be the result of what this entire body makes a decision on. Correct. Yes. Um, for myself, I would be willing to what I believe the community engagement and collaboration subcommittee would be focusing on. I would be happy to help Capture with that or y'all can Capture note that down that that Please. would be where I would like to start um, and I would probably make myself known in the other committees as needed and that's where I'm at on this and I should also note and uh, for point of clarity that the numbers of subcommittee must be limited to less than a quorum of the entire group so we all know that of the, of, I'm sorry of the seated voting members. So it must be limited to that. So. I think for clarity, the question that we're asking if you all are ready to have a conversation about is, are these the right committees? Are there additional committees that we, you think we should have? Are they not the right committees? If no, why? Um, I think that's the conversation we're trying to have now is um, so that we can move this from draft and start moving the work forward. So uh, again, the question is not, are you ready to start a committee tomorrow? But the question we're asking is, are these the right committees? Are they not? Do we need some additional committees? Um, do we need more time to think about the committees? If so, how long? Um, like that's what we're trying to get, get to. Uh, I'd also add to the uh, discuss, we've talked a bunch about this, the committees being sequential. Uh, I think the, if we have committees that are focused on, you know, document drafts or a specific point in the process, yes, they 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 would be sequential. But um, the idea behind the development finance committee and the community engagement collaboration subcommittee, uh, those would be committees that would be ongoing throughout the whole pro the, throughout, throughout the whole process. So they wouldn't they wouldn't fall into that kind of sequ sequential. Uh, pattern that, that something like the RFP drafting or the community benefits agreement subcommittee would. Because we don't get to the community benefits agreement or um, the dra RFP drafting if we don't do the community process. 
or if we haven't decided what we're doing around the URA. So those two committees in, you know, in our vision, I think would start soon so that we can begin the visioning process so that we can begin talking about URA. Um, I don't think we, again, we can't make the URA decision if we haven't had community engagement. Um, and we can't do, um, you know, get to the draft or the community benefits if we haven't talked to the community yet. And so I think our proposal is that those are the first two committees that we move forward on. Um, and then the other committees may come later on. And we may, during the community engagement process, decide there's another committee that we need or something that we haven't thought of. And I think we're open to having that. This isn't the be all, end all. But in order for us to move forward, we're gonna have to make some decisions. Are we doing subcommittees or are we not? And if so, what are they gonna be? Shamika, did you wanna weigh in on that? I would have to agree that I don't hear us being ready to carry forward this conversation because, again, I kind of feel like it's sort of a bait and switch as, I mean, it was stated in the agenda. I understand, like, we have lives outside of this. I was emailed a book. So, like, all of this here on top of this uh, milestone um, write-up. And so my focus was on the conversation that we're going to have based on the agenda. So I admit that's where my time was focused. It was not focused on this milestones page, which de was not a line item, something that I would have any reason to focus on for this particular meeting. So can I, can I say something? I send it out as a template, as a way to follow. And I asked for comments, and I got not a single comment from anyone. Right. And it was basically, this is not as you see, it's a draft. It's just to give you a template where you can fill in the blanks versus having to start completely from scratch. That's all this is, is a template. So it wasn't anything that was etched in stone, like this is the final say-so, because now that you have the co-chairs, it's the co-chair's decision and not Prosper Portland's decision, but it is our decision to be able to put templates and things in place to say, hey, here's where you may want to start at. How you finish de determine is by the group, not by us. Yeah, and that I respect and appreciate. I was just, I don't know if you caught where I was. Yeah, saying. I understand yeah. exactly what you said. And you were talking about the not agenda. Not just for levels. myself, but I'm feeling right. for the table that's what right. I'm hearing. And so the conversation prior to the agenda that had the item, mm -hmm. again, that shouldn't have been on there. Right. Um, the conversation was in relationship to the, um, to identifying the milestones. That's what we left with in our last meeting, to come back and talk about in this meeting. If you remember, Dr. Capuglia asked, what are the milestones? What is it that's right. going to keep us moving forward? And so that was the task that the group was charged with. Mm -hmm. And so we're following up from what we were charged with. And that was the communication via email. Got you. So, and yeah. I think from our ground rules that we talk about being prepared mm -hmm. for the meetings, and I think part of that is making sure that we're paying attention to the documents and being prepared so that we can move the work forward. Yes. And then. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, like you guys said, that's what we talked about last month is having these milestones. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful to Miss Elise, is that who put this together for sure. doing this um, in such a timely fashion and sending it to us in advance. Um, I got the email and I didn't have any feedback, so that's why I didn't respond. Um, but I want to say that I want to volunteer for the community engagement and collaboration subcommittee. Thank you. We'll capture James and then. I think, it, I think it's clear that uh, most of the members here need uh, a little bit more time. So I'm thinking that maybe we should uh, um, set a time for questions and for comment and set a time limit for that. And then everybody email some, some things in to, to your office and then go from there. Because right now, we have the people here saying that they're not ready. So why don't we set up some kind of a timeline? And we have to have timelines, or it won't Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Mr. So, Hobson, oh. I think Julie was up. she was going to answer, deal with the URA conversation, I think. Oh, you were dealing with this? Oh, OK. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, i just like to suggest, I think, I, I don't think that we're going to come to an agreement about all of the subcommittees that we're going to need for the next 24 months, but there is a sense of urgency now that the MOU is signed, the clock is ticking, and we do need to um, just kind of be aware of that. What I am hearing is that I think, and what Lakitha said was that the development slash finance committee and the community engagement needs to start their, that, those two subcommittees would need to start their work 
fairly quickly so that we can continue to move on and make progress with our next meeting, if I understood you correctly. And so I would just like to suggest, can we have a decision on just those two, the existence of those two committees, and then as those recommendations come down, as we meet, as we discuss further, we can talk about what other subcommittees are needed, but I would hate to push pause um, on our momentum because we haven't decided, you know, if we need 12 subcommittees or five subcommittees, because we clearly need those two. So yes. um, I just, I wanted to make that suggestion that it sounds to me like most of us are in agreement with that, and then also say I would um, be happy to serve on the finance subcommittee. Thank you very much, Mr. Hobson. Yeah, I, I guess uh, <laughs> there's always this feeling of, of, of distrust for all of the right reasons, but it just seems like from a time standpoint, I mean, we find ourselves struggling around things that best I can tell, we actually do have control over. You know, I mean, we, we do control this, and if, in fact, we want to make any changes after we decide that these are the committees, we can decide that we want some more committees. So, Absolutely. I mean, I'm not struggling with saying, let's go. I mean, what's right. the problem? Uh, uh, but for me, I, I want to be on the Community Benefits Agreement subcommittee. It sounds like all of us can't be on every committee because you can't have enough folks there that whatever, whatever yeah, beyond the quorum beyond the quorum so yeah. folks need to decide but I mean if folks need more time let's make some calls and ask your pertinent questions so that you can get comfortable but we don't need to be spinning our wheels in my opinion around stuff that we actually do control and we got two co-chairs who have I mean that are representing us that are bringing this to us it's not somebody else these are our own people bringing this to the table for us to look at and to move so I'm, I'm ready to move first Thank you. Uh, Jillian basically said what, what I was going to add on to. I think the hesitance that you hear is just people saying, uh, I don't know what else, but it's clear that we need the, the first level. And I, and I just want to uh, uh, shout out um, the milestones. I mean, this finally crystallizes all this work for me, uh, and it makes it uh, all of a sudden it's much more tangible. So I appreciate the effort. I appreciate the work, and I'll be um, volunteering for the community engagement. Thank you, sir. As I looked at the document, I thought it was already uh, pretty much where we were going to, where we were going to go and just tighten it up on tonight. But the um, uh, community engagement piece is critical uh, for me. So therefore, I'm, I'm uh, going to weigh in on being a part of that community. Thank you very much. Engagement. It's wonderful. So uh, I'd like to point out that we could use some people to help out with the finance side of, <laughs> side of things. <laughs> At first, we, I, I think Jillian kind of called to the question, like, do we want to start with these two committees? Does the, is the group okay with us moving with those yes. two committees to start? Should, um, should and so, did you want to weigh in on something? You wanted to weigh in. The conversation yeah. was just, con sorry, the conversation was continuing. I was just going to say I was interested in the development finance subcommittee, and I do think that starting with two uh, is most pertinent now. Okay, all in favor of moving forward with the, at least these two committees, for the work that we do, just lift your name tag. Just hold him up for a second so he can get the count, please. MJ, you getting the count? MJ's getting the count. Oh, <laughs> not me. Yeah, yeah. yeah you sorry, I'm right, right, yeah, right. right. yeah, trying to illustrate. So go, go again. All right. I'm sorry. Can Any you go opposed? Again? You threw me off. Any opposed? To okay, great. And those two committees, just to make sure we have clarification, are the community engagement and finance. And finance. And finance yeah. Yep, development and finance committee, and then community engagement collaboration subcommittees. And More can be added as necessary. And then as far as um, my and Lakeitha's involvement, I will be on the finance side and she'll be on the community engagement side. Makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. Ms. Goodlaw. Um, I just wanted to um, say that I'm happy to offer technical assistance on both subcommittees, and since I'm non-voting, it won't bother, it won't uh, have any impact on quorum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, now section two. Anything to add or anything that needs to be removed or any thoughts regarding section two? Jillian. Um, the very first one, the URA impact study, I think um, this is just 
gathering existing data. There's a lot of data on the impact of the North Northeast URA, of URAs in general, of gentrification. I mean, there's a lot there that just needs to be condensed. I don't necessarily think we need to commission a whole new study, which is how I'm, how I'm reading that. Um, and then the other thing is just a very ticky tacky thing, 2.4, it's the North, Northeast housing strategy and not Starkey. <laughs> just, well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stephen Green. So I think um, any work around the finance of the URA needs to start with a conversation from CDI, whether they are allowing us to even have that conversation. Um, we've been down the road on your education. I remember with Chair Will Hoyt, 2012, we spent a lot of time a couple blocks away from here and in the next room um, going over that. And I think talking about URA impacts cannot be decoupled from talking about um, the city, the community engagement. I mean, it's, it's, it, would be, uh, it would be untrue to connect urban renewal or S457 to impacts without also connecting it to the lack of trust, the connections, the spheres of influence that were used that were not used over time. And so I think um, as we have that conversation, it's gotta be broader than just ORS 457. But I don't think we can start that conversation unless the CDI gives us a yay or a nay. It just... So do you think it would be beneficial for the <clears throat> subcommittee Development Finance Subcommittee to be present at the um, uh, CDI meeting on the 20th of September, or maybe the I guess co-chairs. I guess, frankly, I'm just surprised that we haven't heard from the CDI yet. I mean, we're already a couple of meetings in, and we haven't heard specifically from them. I believe it's their charge. I, I could be it wrong, is. but that's, no, it is that's ultimately the charge of the CDI to make this recommendation. Thus far, and that's a really big delineation around what the scope of, of a potential project or projects would, would be yep. over time. Correct. Can it, Stephen, on that, uh, I just, uh, what's, I forgot her name. Uh, Alicia? Alicia? Yes. Alicia? We're going to set up a meeting uh, shortly between the two co-chairs and the North, North Northeast yeah. CDI so we can begin to get that ball to roll and so they can begin to have a conversation. So that'll be happening this week. The setting up the meeting we'll have this week and hopefully we'll try to get in the next, I think Alicia said not in the next two weeks, she has some things at prior engagements. So hopefully by, at least by the beginning of October or the middle of October, we'll have that done. Thank you very much. Bryson. Uh, just a kind of a quick note, since we have people who are, uh, joining the meetings and, and the public who would be joining the meetings uh, as much as we can if we can uh, make sure that we uh, say things out so that you know we're not we're not using our own kind of internal acronyms that that people don't necessarily understand uh, so just just make sure that part of the part of the audience doesn't necessarily uh, been a part of this conversation the whole time um, and so a little bit of background explanation or, or saying out uh, acronyms would would be helpful right Thank you very um, much. What's the phone? Joy is on the phone yeah, apparently, been, but she said she's been trying to ask a question, but we can't hear her. Uh, we have technical difficulties, but I can call her. Okay. I'll let her know. I guess I would also add that on the finance committee, I would, I guess I would love a recommendation from the CDI before we go down that road of doing all the research and everything on the URA. Um, if, if they are the, the one decider. So. All right, are we trying to reach Joy? Okay. Mm, okay. Can we get it? Hmm. No, I was just going to add it right here. Can you hear me? Hello, Joy. Hey, I've been on the phone for a while, but no one can hear me. No, um, we couldn't. You were the I wanted to make a quick comment. Um, first of all, a little disappointed that no one told me this really draft document I emailed after the meeting would be on the agenda. There's quite a few changes that I would have made before sharing it to the larger group. 
Um, second of all, I know you guys already voted and didn't get a chance to hear me around um, which two subcommittees to move forward with. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to stress to how difficult it is to negotiate community benefits agreements, and very often around the country, it's something that community-based organizations struggle with, and without, and mostly due to the fact that it's rushing and not having proper education around how to negotiate and best practices from around the city, or around the nation. So I would, um, I know it's a late comment, you've already voted, but um, I would recommend that if we can't have a subcommittee start with community benefits agreements, that we at least get some education around um, how, how they work, how they function, so we can understand the limitations of them, but also the opportunities, um, because it's a really big part of, I think, this committee work. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joy. I think, as was stated, I don't know if you heard, but uh, clearly around the table was no um, dissension around that being a important part. And so I think there's agreement to a community benefits agreement subcommittee as well as the RFP subcommittee that could be combined. So uh, no limitations around the committees that possibly will, will come out of the, out of the group. All right, briefly then, just the next two sections, I'm briefly in terms of um, not trying to force one thing or another, but wanting to get input and gain insight. Section three, if we're ready to move past section two, <clears throat> in terms of thinking, community visioning. And actually this can be some of the subcommittee determination of what that specifically would look like. So, so I, I, I wonder um, if uh, there's some pre-work that should be done that contains to, pertains to milestone four so that we can shape when we do have that community visioning conversation around the limitations of the property and the site. Um, so there's, I think there's some, some good context would be helpful as we have those conversations so that someone could know whether it could be an airport or a big, huge park or whatever. Um, and so I, I think there's some, some scoping that, that should be done before we have that community visioning project so that okay. we can help people understand the, the bandwidth there. See me, I'd like to add on it. I am uh, actually have reached out to the planning, the zoning, and the permitting department uh, to try to schedule a meeting and we, we have entitled it uh, Mythbusters. So it's myths around planning, zoning, and permitting process. And we're trying to get that so we can do a workshop for the whole group. So there are things behind the scenes that as we start developing, I'm trying to go along to make sure that we get those things. So, you know, we know there's a lot of education that has to take place because most people, as you saw, there's a, an abundance of people in the community development portion and not very many people in the finance and development. And so that's the world in which I play in, which I'll try to help you know, shape and motivate, you know, leaning on Julian since, you know, she's development, you know, living on um, Mr. Fraser because he is in construction. So finding the people around the table that have those necessary skills, you know, to come kind of not like the subcommittee groups, but just as groups just to talk to, to give, you know, what information am I missing to be able to help the, the group to make a, a solid decision when it comes to, you know, permitting zoning. Like you said, what can be put there? You know, you want to put the Taj Mahal, but you can really only put a McDonald's box there. And so instead of going down this, you know, street of chasing these wild dreams, you know, how do we stop those wild dreams and say, hey, you know, you can get A, B, and C. You can't get X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that that's clear to, to the organization before you make a decision on choosing a developer. Shabri, thank you. Um, in the milestone three portion, one of the things we talked about was the fact that there had already been extensive community visioning just around um, these areas. And so I would like to just include adding some of what has happened or at least just a portion. And um, Leslie, we talked about this. Your team did an amazing job around engagement and captured a lot of information. And so I think we would be remiss to not also include at least some of what you learned from that. You have already sent out a ton of stuff. And so I think for this subcommittee or this milestone, it would just be great to make sure that we take time certain on the agenda to look that over or at least to just kind of capture what were the major things that were codified from that. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it should be called out so that we're not duplicating efforts. Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else in section three? Is that a comment? Mm -hmm. 
Beth? I was just going to add that the CDI also they did a lot of community engagement around the economic development. So if we're mm -hmm. going to, we want to make sure we capture all of that, mm -hmm. so folks have an opportunity to see what folks said they wanted um, to be done with these dollars um, in the URA, and that we incorporate that into whatever it is we decide to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. How and the other comments things uh, from your standpoint, Leslie, were TIF eligible things that ultimately you could use tax increment finance for as you were going through that process? One more time. How, how much of what the community came up with were things that were, were actually TIF eligible? Would you say? Tax well, increment finance, I said, I said that already once. For <laughs> the, on the housing side, probably about 75% of it. Um, we did have a lot of requests for things like um, estate planning, helping families keep houses in their, you know, keep them in their family, um, assistance with like past due taxes, those kinds of things um, that we can't use TIF dollars, tax in increment financing for. Um, but probably 75% of it was that what we could do with, you know, was home repair, home ownership, and more affordable rental units. Those were, those were the primary things that people asked for, at least in, in our engagement. Um, and then we had a lot of other things like ADUs and accessory dwelling units, um, and, but a, and a rent assistance and things, other things that the Housing Bureau does that we don't pay for out of um, tax increment financing. Thank you. Any other input? Section three. Keep that. I think it'll be important for this group to also understand that they're going to probably have to have a representative from BDS, Bureau of Development Services, um, because the kinds of technical assistance that were indicated in some of the visioning processes had to do around the state planning. And even though there might not be TIF funds, that uh, knowledge base is something that the city has and will help guide individuals on how processes work that are overlapping in development processes. So um, we've been thinking about that in the mayor's office and I'll reach out to BDS to see if they can have someone because they constantly engage with um, community members about how uh, Bureau of Development Services, I said that at the beginning, BDS, um, how that works. I'm sorry if I'm using acronyms. I said it Thank once, you. but just so you all know. Thank you. I appreciate it. Important. All right, are we ready to move to section four? Yes, I saw you. Yes, we, I thought we are. I, okay. I, I was just going to say for a lot of the things that we can't do, a part of what we can talk about are how we can build direct partnerships, co location of services, things like that at this space, because there are groups that are tasked with, that are supposed to, that are interested in doing things like this for community yeah. members. So I don't know that it needs to be a limitation as to how we'll fund something. No. Right. We can find partners to do that. Excellent. Section four then. Anything to add? Any suggestion, thought? Manefa? One section four, we're developing a workshop right now around this of um, basically community planning. What does the community want to see? So we are diligently behind the scenes working on that. Um, and as we have things put together, uh, I think we want to do four of them. Um, I think it's like three or either four of those community events where we get a community vision and plan what the community wants to see. And so we know that, uh, hearing from Tony the last time, that we want to make sure that not only did we have events during the evening, but we also had events during the weekend because some people work during the weekend, can't get off. And so we want to make sure that we have that open. So still in the process of planning and once we get it together we will definitely will present it to the group and then the group can take it and form well, the it now that we have one yes mm -hmm. that work Jillian uh, two things one I just want to make sure that we got um, putting land use zoning um, uh, area uh, floor area ratio density parking all of those kind of zoning mm -hmm. situate into uh, kind of the pre-work for milestone three Otherwise, it needs to be in this one because otherwise we determine the site use and it doesn't fit the zoning, then that's a problem. 
And then the other thing um, was I would like to request, Mina, for that there's a lot of stuff that seems to be um, in the process, but kind of behind the scenes, as you say. And it'd be great to have like a little, e even if it's not set in stone, just a schedule of what you guys are doing so that we know, um, okay, well, this is in process and we want to have input in this way. Well, it would be, it'd be, that's what the group really is great. for, and that's what we've been doing. We've been having the meetings with the, the co chairs. I mean, I, like so, on a paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so actually Bryson and I had a conversation earlier today that what we're going to add on the regular agenda is like a co-chairs awesome. update and part of the um, that you all be because we are we're having meetings weekly and checking in and moving for like checking on the agenda and so we'll do that monthly do a co-chairs check awesome. in and you all Thank have you. details of what we've been doing perfect so I will suspend number five for the sake of time um, Bryson you have something you want to, to cover uh, yeah, when we were drafting the, the charter, one of, when we were talking about um, membership requirements and things like that, one of the big issues was attendance. Um, and uh, I believe we've got one, uh, one member, we've, we have one member who has recently resigned because he hadn't been able to, to make meetings. But we've got another member who um, uh, has, has not, and to my knowledge, I and Minefer can correct me on this, I don't believe he's made a, a single meeting. Um, he he may, may, have been, may, have been at the, may have been at the first one, but one. You know, we've had nine, 10 meetings at this point. Um, and so I, I, think at, I think at this point, I, I'd like to nominate that uh, Rakeem Washington, uh, that we have a vote for Rakeem Washington to be removed as a member. Um, I mean, this, this group takes a lot of commitment, takes a lot of time. People need to be on the same page. People need to be committed to this uh, if we're going to get things done. Um, so, so I would move for that. So any question, any comment? What was the question? R the person, sorry, is Rakeem Washington. Who resigned? Oh, resigned is Chris Gwynn. Michael? I don't, um, yeah. N not opposed to, to taking the action. I, I guess just procedurally for the next person, is there something that would have us reach out to say, based on your you know, lack of participation, we are questioning your commitment to remaining active and just have you know, people validate one way or the other. Um, and, and because I, otherwise I'm gonna ask, you know, has anybody reached out to him? You know, did his dog die? I, I mean, I mean I'd, I'd like us to at least be able to, to verify that it's a lack of interest versus something else that we might find but then the, the accountability is to also notify. When I've had to miss a meeting and other people, they've done that. But I, I just like us to maybe take that one extra step to make sure that everybody is real clear about what's being done and why. Yeah, yeah, and I, th I, I think that is important. I, th I think while we as members have a responsibility to, to notify people, we're not gonna be able to, to, to make meetings and, and things like that. Um, and we have a responsibility to, if, you know, say, say something happened and his email changed, and so he wasn't getting the emails to, to contact and be proactive to, to make sure that that um, that those things are, are in, in place. Um, but I do I do think that uh, Menefer has reached out to uh, Rakeem Washington uh, on a few occasions no to, so I need to, know. to see where he is. <laughs> Justice? I'm just asking, are we making a vote or are we gonna, this will be a decision made next, like what's the process? I'm, I'm my own thoughts, but I wanna not be flipping. So. so. Say for the next time? No, I'm saying like, will this be a decision like we're saying, okay, we're putting this on the table and then right. next time we make the decision or do we make the decision now? Yeah, th this, is, this is on the table to make a decision now. We're, right now we're making the discussion and then after we're done, well, we'll have a vote. I support making that move. It's all in favor. All in favor. You, got, you got a question. I'm oh. here. Shabri. Shabri, thank Less you. a question and more just a um, uh, comment. 
uh, knowing Rakim, I think he, I, I mean, he hasn't been at all any of the meetings, and so I think that there was probably some miscommunication initially as to who or why or what was, what was happening, and, and I don't know why he hasn't responded. I mean, I know he has a really big job, and it was a newer position for him. Um, I do think that we need to, he's not here and he hasn't been able to be here, so I do support uh, and I will vote uh, as the co-chairs have asked. Um, but I think as we bring new people in or whatever that looks like, whatever partners they may be connected to, I think just a very clear distinction as to what's the expectation because he hasn't been here from, I don't know, was he here at the first meeting? I feel like he was when we were at. Uh, but I don't think he was actually sitting at the table. Oh, I don't think he was sitting at the table. I think he might have been like a, are there alternates or something? Is, are mm. there, either way, <clears throat> I just think as we bring new people on, whatever that looks like, really clear expectation setting, which I think is done in the, in the charter and is here now. Again, when he might have been here or not, there wasn't a charter, there wasn't anything. I think we need to go ahead and, and vote forward. I just want to speak to Rakeem, and I don't want us to all have it sound like he just was a horrible person. Um, no. He's not. Yeah. Love him. So. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So in the matter of uh, removing Rakeem Washington from the project working group, all in favor, if you lift your card. All right. 100% of the voting members. I'm voting no. It wasn't? I'm sorry. Did I miss? All opposed. Sorry. Sorry. I missed it. Who votes in favor and keeping him? If you would, those who vote in favor, if you turn your. You abstain. Okay. Those in favor of keeping him? Those in favor of booting him? No. Yeah. So the vote was those in favor of removing. Removing. Right. And of that vote, Sharon, you abstained? Yeah. Who else did not vote? Was there others? And Shamika. Okay. Sorry. Someone. Someone like this. Wrong color. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very well. Thank you. At this moment, we are at 748, and we are going to, unless there's something we didn't cover, we're going to open it up for some public comment. And if you are here and you'd like to comment, here's the, the sheet for you to fill out. I've got one. And uh, I don't know if any of us. Anyone else like to comment? Who's got, is Yvonne still here? Who's, oh, there you are. Who's got the, do we know? Public comment? Hmm? So we will have you come to the table when I call your name, and you will be given a time limit to have your public comment. Right yeah, but I need your card. You can come now, but I'll need you to fill one out. It is on the way. You need what filled out? <laughs> I want to capture your name, sir. PC Perry. PC, no space, no periods, both caps. Perry. P is in Portland, E R I. Thank you so much. You've got three minutes starting now. Charles. I'd like to ask you a question about the uh, property. If I'm correct, you would be the person to address as to the percentage of footprint that Legacy would have on the 1.7 acres. And the question would be, is that percentage of what Dr. Brown was asking for to be on the property 40% of that property or 50%? Legacy is looking for a certain square footage. Right. I, I don't know, I don't recall exactly what percentage of the property it was, but uh, it was a, I don't want to guess, it, it was a certain square footage amount, and then from so what I recall, like it was not. 35, something along 30. 32 to 35,000 right. square right. feet. And, and it really depended on what is put on the property because it could be multi-level. We're just looking for some potential uh, medical care facility space on the property. Right, but I'm questioning 
of that 32, 35,000 square feet, what proportion that is of the available 1.7 acres? Is that 40% or 50%? Well, it, it really depends. A lot Sorry? of people named Charles in the room. It really depends on what type of structure is built on that property because if it's a multi-level structure, if we could have 32 or 35,000 square feet, that could represent uh, a smaller or larger percentage of the total. We just don't know what's going on the property, but from Legacy's perspective, that was the targeted square footage we were looking at or okay. considering. I wonder if at some point during these hearings, or presentations, we can get that clarified so the community understands of this large 1.7 acres, how many McDonald's are gonna fit. So, so, so right, right now, um, as far as we are in the, the process, we'll, we'll get to the point where we've got an idea of how big a structure, what the structure is gonna be used for. Um, we, we just haven't gotten to that point yet. I um, so when we get I to that point, you, you guys will, will be notified. Great. Yeah. Uh, it would be helpful also if we had a handout of the points you did discuss for consideration today made public and available to us who have come from the community. Absolutely. And available to anyone who calls in and says, I'm interested too. Absolutely. You, outside Absolutely. of being online or um, would you prefer them mailed or having access to them. We do post all of them online and all the meeting minutes and all those things, right. but if that's not accessible and there are other ways that you want us to get that information out. Online is wonderful, oh. in print is also great. Okay, so yeah. So I'll be looking we for a copy. Uh, w one of y'all could probably find it online, so I'll take your sheet from what you don't need today. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Yes, and it is our effort. I don't know how uh, all of the copies, there were plenty of copies out mm -hmm. front. So okay. it's usually the effort and all of the other meetings and all handouts that we go through are available so that everybody who comes can go through the material. But thank you for that point of clarity. Thank Make you. sure that, thank you. Appreciate uh, that. And, and One last thing of the three minutes. Um, having to do with the uh, subcommittees, uh, will those be, those meeting times and places be available? For instance, the uh, zoning, issues when they come up. I think those would be of immense interest and we would like to make sure we have that available. All subcommittee meetings, all meetings pertaining to this work will be uh, public, publicly notified Good. Mm -hmm. so Thank that people can much. come. Thank you. And Appreciate I think it. I want to add to just an answer to your question you asked about legacy and one thing in the um, MOU is that legacy, it says possibly a legacy space and also there was a, another addendum that said possibly a community-led or nonprofit space, and so there's not a full commitment that Legacy, like that's what they've asked for, um, but they also put a small caveat in there that it could be a nonprofit health space or something else in there I'm glad you brought that up because when I uh, spoke in percentage, 50% or 40%, I'm talking about ground floor percentage, not high rise. Yeah, and there's, again, there's no, commitment that it would be ground floor or if we're doing high rise or what yet. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon? Sure. As far as the document in the mic, please. As far as the documentation for the community to be able to access, I thought we said with all of our community partners that we would put some paper documents out to where people who may not have access to the internet would be able to get go to those places and be able to get a paper copy. And we had brought that up maybe several meetings back. Need to speak into the mic, sir. Sharon, if you can tell me where you would like those delivered sure. in the different so, places, if you can email it to me, I'll be more than happy to deliver them. Yeah, I mean, we have on here, um, the Urban League, you have the NAACP, you have SEI, you have uh, the Northeast um, Health Clinic right up on Martin Luther King, and just some central locations that already give out information to the community, so where people know where they're located. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the other person we have signed up is Miss Bird.
Good evening. If you'll hey. state your name, you've How got it. How are you, Bishop minutes. Holt? I'm Bird. I'm so fantastic. just as a point of clarification, Leslie, I want to make sure I understood what you said, that Prosper Portland transferred all of their housing property to Portland Housing Bureau in 2010. Is that right? At the time that the Portland Housing Bureau was formed, mm -hmm. all of the loans on um, housing properties, all the home ownership loans, all the home repair loans, were transferred to the Housing Bureau. So and all of that fell under the Housing Bureau's purview. Including all of Profit Portland's housing properties. I'm talking specifically housing properties. They were transferred in 2010. I just want to make sure we understood what you said is, back there. Is there a specific property that you're concerned with that I can do some research on? Because it's my understanding no, I'm not mad. I just want to be clear. It's ridiculous. I, I just want to be clear that when the Housing Bureau was formed, mm -hmm. all of the housing related dollars, projects, loans, all transferred to the Portland Housing Bureau from Prosper Portland or BHCD, which was the other organization they took the housing related items and combined them into the Portland Housing Bureau. Okay, so I just wanna read from the 2017 audit of Profit Portland. It says, we focused our audit scope on Prosper Portland's real estate holdings in 2016 and its oversight of four properties operated by third parties. We excluded properties dedicated to housing, all of which Prosper Portland transferred to the Portland Housing Bureau in 2017. So should I believe the audit that came out last year or should I take your data? Because when I research something, it's always backed with documentation. And the reason that's important is directly related to the possibility of including this land in the interstate corridor urban renewal area. According to this document, the audit that came out in 2017, all housing property was transferred to the Portland Housing Bureau last year. The Portland Housing Bureau, under state law, owns the housing bond, over $250 million towards affordable housing. So if you all are discussing putting affordable housing on that property, my very legitimate question is, why couldn't money come from that $250 million to develop housing? That couldn't happen, Cupid? I, oh, I, I can explain why. Well, Cupid was shaking his head, no. Because the way the bond is currently structured, mm -hmm. any, any property that we spend those dollars on belongs to the city. Right. So what we want to do with this particular piece of property is that the community would own and benefit from any housing that goes onto that property. So if, we own, if the city owns it, then that means that, that all of the profit, all of the rent, anything, comes back to the city, it does not go to the community. And so that's why bond funds would not be the best option as the law currently is written. In November- Right, it's on the ballot. It, it, it's on the ballot. Yeah. And if that changes, then we could potentially use bond funds on this piece of property. So a theme tonight is trust. And everyone is saying that what makes this process different is this committee. I would like to bring everyone's attention to 2010. There was a similar community-led committee. In 2010, we were very much aware of the impact the interstate urban renewal area has had in expediting gentrification. We were very much aware of that. 2010, under the leadership of Mayor, who was it, Sam Adams, the discussion about expanding the URA interstate was on the table again. You all are saying what makes a difference is this commi com committee, it's community folks. There were community folks on this committee, at least two of which are on the project working group. We knew the damage the interstate urban renewal area had caused, it was 2010. Despite that knowledge, the committee voted for the expansion again. What's interesting about this document though is it names people and organizations 
who got a direct monetary benefit from including the interstate urban renewal area. I, I mean, expanding the interstate urban renewal area. And so when we're concerned about trust and the reason why that response just does not hold any weight, we've been here before. And like I said, at least two people on this committee were, were on that committee knew the damage the interstate urban renewal area caused to the black community and voted to expand it anyway. Finally, I have a very exhaustive internal document from Emmanuel Hospital. Tony Hobson, all due respect, not to single you out. Have you read this document? It's very telling. This document details Emmanuel's plans and activities dating all the way back from 1970 into 2035 or 2021. It's filled with pictures, ideas, everything. I wanna know if this committee has read this document. Has anybody on the committee read this document? Okay. I'm not sending you anything. I'm not sending you anything. Thank you, Lakeitha. The reason I bring this document up, it's very telling. And what I would like to know, because there are some very solid plans in that property in this document. What is it, Sharon? Oh. Yeah. What I want to know is what you all are doing, does it supplement these plans? Supplant these plans, I should say? Or does it supplement them? How does this work interact with this document that very well details Emmanuel's plans? I mean, every square foot, including that property. How do you all interact with this document? I appreciate that. Thank you, Bert. That's time. Sharon, you did you have a comment? No? no? Okay. Walt? I'm just curious. I don't even know what document you're talking about, and maybe we could talk offline, but I would love to see the document you're talking about. Uh, that would be very helpful for this committee if we don't want to make the same mistakes of our past. So, thank you. All right. Thank you. You adjourn. We appreciate the time and the energy. Any comments from the, yes, thank you very much. Any comments from our project working group? Yes. Did you have, go ahead. Not to belabor anything, but being a board member at Legacy, I, I don't know exactly what document you're referring to, so if you can give me the name of it, I'd be happy to respond. I'm, but I'm not trying to be rude or anything. I don't feel like you're being rude. Okay. I, just, I just want to know so what you're talking about. The document is not easy to come by. I'm thankful that I have it. The only person on this committee that I would even consider sharing this with is Mr. Tony Hobson. But that's fine. I just want the name of it because as a board member, I'm sure if the document exists, I can get it. Okay. Shemika. Um, I, this is kind of a deviation from where we've landed right now, but because we, again, I'm, I'm just going by the papers that are put in front of me. Um, one of the things we were talking about discussing was the future uh, agenda. Um, I was hoping to, again, I'm not a co-chair, so my request is that we could add to the agenda something that came up during the last meeting but seems like it's been shelved and that was the budget conversation i see again my expectation was to come to this meeting and cover the bu budget discussion and with respect to adding um, the hill block to the ura but even just the budget discussion taking one step back the general budget discussion every meeting we've been to i saw a budget I and I still have a copy of the budget that was given to us and we have still not in length like discussed that was the draft budget that was given to us these are funds that were um, appropriated and then has re-upped by the mayor and we still haven't really gone through that document uh, talking about appropriations are we being good stewards of that money um, the money that has now been extended by legacy same thing are are we doing well by what we've been rendered so that we're planning to go through these milestones um, in a responsible way. Sorry, thank you very Add much. A full on budget conversation to next time. Our next meeting is the first Wednesday of October. 
530 at this location. And I would ask for any other uh, project working group members, voting members especially, if there are uh, items for discussion related to being on the agenda, you can interact with your co-chairs. All right, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, community members, for staying.